So we're in Isaiah 47, the whole chapter, all the words will be on the screen, where it's addressed here to the power, the great power of the day, Babylon, both a city and an empire. And these are words direct from the Lord himself through Isaiah. The Lord says, go down, sit in the dust. Virgin daughter Babylon, sit on the ground without a throne, queen city of the Babylonians. No more will you be called tender or delicate. Take millstones and grind flour. Take off your veil. Lift up your skirts, bare your legs, and wade through the streams. Your nakedness will be exposed and your shame uncovered. I will take vengeance. I will spare no one. Our Redeemer, the Lord Almighty is his name, is the Holy One of Israel. Sit in silence. Go into darkness. Queen city of the Babylonians. No more will you be called queen of kingdoms. I was angry with my people and desecrated my inheritance. I gave them into your hand and you showed them no mercy. Even on the aged, you laid a very heavy yoke. You said, I am forever the eternal queen. But you did not consider these things or reflect on what might happen. Now then listen, you lover of pleasure, lounging in your security, and saying to yourself, I am, and there is none besides me. I will never be a widow, or suffer the loss of children. Both of these will overtake you in a moment, on a single day, loss of children and widowhood. They will come upon you in full measure, in spite of your many sorceries and all your potent spells. You have trusted in your wickedness and have said, no one sees me. Your wisdom and knowledge mislead you when you say to yourself, I am, and there is none besides me. Disaster will come upon you and you will not know how to conjure it away. A calamity will fall upon you that you cannot ward off with a ransom. A catastrophe you cannot foresee will suddenly come upon you. Keep on then with your magic spells and your many sorceries, which you have labored at since childhood. Perhaps you will succeed, perhaps you will cause terror. All the counsel you have received has only worn you out. Let your astrologers come forward, those stargazers who make predictions month by month. Let them save you from what is coming upon you. Surely they are like stubble. The fire will burn them up. They cannot even save themselves from the power of the flame. These are not calls for warmth. This is not a fire to sit by. That is all they are to you. These you have dealt with and labored with since childhood. All of them go on in their error. There is not one that can save you. Well, I remember uh, my first history lesson in secondary school, at least in sort of the advanced stages of secondary school, the teacher began with something like this, which we were to write down in our jotters our notebooks. He said, at the beginning of the 20th century, Britain was the most powerful nation in the world. That struck me at the time. And uh, all these 40 years later, it's still in my mind, the most powerful nation in the world with a huge empire. But, but now, <laughs> well, very different now, of course, a century later. And Isaiah himself is talking about in his time, or in a, in a future time, in fact, the most powerful nation in the world. The nation of Babylon. The empire of Babylon. The city of Babylon. Again, remember that Isaiah is talking about things future, things that haven't happened yet. He's talking about a time when Babylon would become the greatest power in the world. It would become the world's superpower. Like 
the US or China today. And he's predicting the time when that power would be overwhelmed by another greater power. Kingdoms rise and fall, don't they? Empires rise and fall. They have always. There's only one kingdom that lasts forever. The kingdom of our God. He's predicting the future here, and his predictions turned out to be absolutely right. And that showed, as we've said before, that he was a true prophet of God. And that his God, who is our God, the God of the Bible, is the true God, is the one true God, proved by the fact that he can tell the future and it comes to pass. No idols can do that. No humans can do that. No angels can do that. Only God can tell the future, actually foretell what will happen, and then make it happen. Now, of course, maybe you're thinking, well, I know there are some people around, they're called critics, and they will say that these words, these words of prediction or promise about the future, in Isaiah and other parts of the Bible, were actually written much later, in fact, after the events had taken place. They just dismiss any possibility of supernatural or divine prediction of the future, even before considering any evidence. That's very common in the academic world. They'll say that Isaiah was written, or this part of Isaiah, actually it wasn't written by Isaiah at all, it was written by somebody who sort of followed Isaiah, and he wrote it much later, really after Babylon had come to power, perhaps even after Babylon had been destroyed. But just think about it. Does that really make sense of what we have here? One of the big lines of argument, we've seen this again and again, haven't we? One of the big things for Isaiah is that his God, who is our God, is able to tell the future. And that is what makes him God. Over against all of the idols, then and now. That is what proves that he is the one true God, that he can tell the future, and it does come to pass. But if, in fact, these prophecies, these words, are not really predictions about the future at all, they're just about things that have already happened, and actually Isaiah's writing, or someone like Isaiah's writing afterwards, after they've actually happened, then really the whole argument falls apart. The whole book falls apart. It's such a key argument for Isaiah, or in this book. What it would mean is this, Isaiah was not a true prophet at all. He wasn't able to tell the future. Actually, he was lying. He was pretending he could, but he couldn't. And it would also mean, and this is more significant, that his God, who is our God, is also not able to tell the future. And therefore, he cannot be the true God. So maybe we're kidding ourselves as well. That's what it would mean if these words were actually written much later, after these things had happened. I think if that had happened, if that was true, Isaiah would be dismissed, his writings would have been thrown out of the window, they would never have survived, and they surely would never have become part of God's holy book of the Bible. Surely they would never have lasted. If these things are not really predictions, they're just things written after the event the whole thing would be undermined by the fact that these were not true predictions. I think the fact that the book of Isaiah has survived, that it it still speaks to us today, must mean that it is authentic that these predictions really were made years before the events actually happened to Assyria, to Babylon, to the destruction of Babylon, to the coming of Cyrus, to destroy Babylon. All of those things were made years before. Let me me illustrate it this way. Imagine I write something today on social media, let's say in a tweet, for example, that's about all I can manage in social media, a few words on, on, 
on Twitter. And I say this on my tweet today, one day in the future, here's my prophecy, one day in the future, a man will become the President of the United States who will be the first black man to be the President. What would you say to that? You would say, that's already happened. That's not prediction. You're not a prophet. I don't pretend to be, by the way. Now, Isaiah is hardly going to write things and make such a big deal of it that pretend to be a prediction when they've already happened. Wouldn't the whole thing fall apart? Wouldn't his whole argument fall to the ground? It's not going to look good for him or for his God if the whole thing is just history. So that's why I believe, or one reason why I believe that this really is miraculous or divine or supernatural prediction that proves that God is the one true God. And these things did happen. Now when Isaiah was writing, as we said, Babylon was, was the, he was not at that, sorry, Babylon was not at that point the great superpower in the world. Assyria was the great superpower. But sure enough, it would become the power that overcame Assyria and became the, uh, the America or the China of its day. And it also would have its own day of defeat when it would be humiliated, overthrown. Verse 1 has that, doesn't it? Go down, says God through Isaiah. Sit in the dust, virgin daughter Babylon. Sit on the ground without a throne, queen city of the Babylonians, and so on. Babylon was beautiful. It was powerful. It was proud. This is obviously not a picture as such. Well, it's a picture, but it's not a photo. It's a representation. It's an impression of what it might have looked like. It was a mighty, impressive city, Babylon. And here it is under the setting sun, looking tremendous. The brick wall was five, uh, 56 miles long. Its um, uh, wall was 300 feet high. That's um, 100 meters high, 25 feet thick. It had 250 towers around the walls that were 450 feet. That's 150 meters high and a wide and deep moat that encircled the city. There were many features of the city that were just beautiful and impressive, and powerful. And they felt very strong and very secure, as perhaps you can see from Isaiah's prophecy. They felt like they were indestructible, unassailable, impregnable. In fact, they felt like, did you notice, they were as great and powerful as God himself. What did they say about themselves? Did you notice in verses 8 and 11? I am. Who says I am? Only the Lord says I am. Only he has the right to say I am. And there is none besides me. These are exact words the Lord uses for himself. They're repeated again in verse 10. When you see your wisdom and knowledge mislead you, when you say to yourself, I am. And there's none besides me. They felt like they were God. And nothing and no one could overturn them. They called themselves, what? The eternal queen. I am forever. I will never be defeated. And yet, disaster was coming, and it was coming fast, and it was coming sure, and Babylon would be brought down to the dust and down to the darkness, verse 5. The darkness of death. The great queen city, or verse 1, or verse 5, or again verse 7, the eternal queen, would be reduced to a mere slave girl. That's the picture in the first three verses there. This is the picture of a slave girl. As to take off the veil, take millstones and grind flour. And her shame would be exposed. The ruler, the ruler of the whole world would become a mere slave girl. 
humiliated utterly. Why? Why was this going to happen? Well, not for no reason, of course. God never punishes people for no reason. It was, for one thing, verse 6, because of the way they had treated God's people. Did you notice? It was true that God had given his people into the hand of the Babylonians as an act of discipline for their disobedience, but you showed them no mercy. This was judgment without mercy, as James says in chapter 2 of his letter. Judgment without mercy. And even on the aged, he says, you laid a heavy, a very heavy yoke. They had gone too far. They had overstepped the mark. They were only ever, and they didn't get this, they were only ever tools in God's hands. They were not themselves God. They were not free to do whatever they pleased. But they've done so without mercy. And even with the aged, and the Bible teaches us, doesn't it, to show respect for the ages, aged, for the elderly. It's in Leviticus. Not only that, but another reason why they were to be destroyed and humiliated was because of their arrogance. That arrogance we've referred to already, their great arrogance, that self-centered pride. Verse 8, now listen, you lover of pleasure, lounging in your security and saying to yourself, I am and there is none besides me. I will never be a widow or suffer the loss of children. Verse 10, you have trusted in your wickedness and have said, no one sees me. I can do whatever I like and get away with it. scot free. Your wisdom and knowledge, particularly their sorcery, their magic arts, have uh, mislead you. When you say to yourself, I am and there is none beside. No one can touch me, I'm untouchable. And God would come down on them like a ton of bricks. And the third thing I think, so we see, don't we, the punishment that is going to come to them. We see that that is because of their pride and the way they've treated God's people. And finally we see their powerlessness to do anything about that. Helpless, powerless. That's the point of the final verses. Um, verse 9, for example, they will come upon you, these losses, these disasters in full measure, in spite of your many sorceries and all your potent spells, they will have no power whatsoever. Verse 11, Disaster will come upon you, and you will not know how to conjure it away. You won't come up with fancy spells that will be able to somehow stop the judgment of God. Calamity will fall on you that you cannot ward off with a ransom. And he sums it up with those words at the end of 15. There is not one that can save you. All these astrologers, all these wise men, all these special advisors in the court of King Nebuchadnezzar, for example. Useless. All their magic tricks, all their techniques, all their technologies, all their knowledge, all their astrology. This is where astrology started, by the way, with the Babylonians. The signs of the zodiac we have today are Greek versions of what they initially classified and catalogued all those years ago. Nothing, none of this, will be able to save them from the judgment of Israel's God. They spent hours and hours on this stuff. You see that, don't you, in these verses. Verse 12, keep on then, go ahead. Go ahead and, and try and see what you can do with your, your special magic, your magic spells and your many sorceries, which you have labored at since childhood. Verse 13, all the counsel you have received over all those years has only worn you out. Again and again, there's a sense that you've spent so much time on this stuff. And Babylon had libraries full of volumes on, um, on omens and uh, spells and how to read uh, an animal's um, 
you split open an animal and look at the entrails, the innards, and try and read what it says, like reading tea leaves. Or look at the stars and see how they're aligned. And they had books and books and books of information about what that meant. And whether it was a sign that you should go into battle or not go into battle. Or change the king or not change the king or, or, or whatever. And they had spent years and years, their whole lives devoted to this kind of science or knowledge or pursuit. And it was a complete and utter waste of time because it had no power. The Babylonians were the, were, were the world leaders in that kind of thing. So we see, don't we, in this passage, the shape of it is that there's a punishment promised it's all future, but it did come. A punishment promised because of their pride. And then we see the absolute powerlessness in the face of this far greater power. The power of the Lord Almighty himself. I'm sure Babylon thought that Israel's God was a puny little God. Because they had swept aside Israel with no problem. Thank you very much. But they'd never understood that actually they were in the hands of this God and they were being used to discipline his people. Well, we know that later, later in the Bible, particularly in the book of Revelation, chapters 17 to 19, Babylon, the word Babylon became a symbol, actually a kind of code name for the world. The world in its sin, the world in its opposition to God, the world in its proud rebellion against God. The world in its sinful self-indulgence, see verse 8. And the world in its persecution of God's people. Babylon became a kind of a code word for the world in that respect. The world of sin. And so it's still with us today. It's always been with us. The spirit of Babylon. Babylon. So how can we resist its influence in our lives now? Well, let me give you a few uh, ways that I think the, the passage leads us towards. We're reminded again, aren't we, powerfully, I think, to trust the Lord, the one true God, and trust his word. Why? Well, because you can. You can trust him. He's proven again and again that he is true, the one true God, and his word is true. And it is utterly reliable. I think the studies you've done, some of you have done with Stuart in, in Second Kings and other parts of the Old Testament have shown the utter reliability of God's word. It never fails. Babylon would become a great power. Babylon would suffer a great defeat at the hands of Cyrus. And all of this was predicted and promised by God's word. We can trust the Lord and we can trust his word. We're reminded, I think, too, that there will be a day of judgment, that there is coming upon the whole world a day of judgment. Every disaster in time, in fact, is a reminder, even a merciful reminder, as harsh and severe as it may be, of the great and dreadful day of the Lord the great and dreadful day of judgment that will surely come. And it will come very suddenly, according to verse 9. I don't know if you noticed. Uh, both of these, he said, loss of children. He's talking about citizens. Uh, he's talking about uh, the, the, um, the nation itself. Both of these will overtake you in a moment on a single day. Loss of children and widowhood. First Thessalonians Chapter 5, which I think some of you are studying in the ladies' Bible study, or perhaps have done, promises that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. There'll be no time to kind of, kind of react when it's upon us. No time. While people are saying peace and safety, and I'm sure many were saying in Babylon, we're all right, we're safe, we're secure, nobody can touch us. Destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman. 
Some of you have had that experience. And they will not escape. Sudden destruction. So, we're told, or Babylon is told, to consider these things, verse 7. That's exactly what they hadn't done. They hadn't thought about it. You did not consider these things. You didn't think about the consequences of your actions. You didn't think about the way you were living. You didn't think about judgment day. You weren't living in the light of that. So easy for us to go the same way, isn't it? To forget that there's a day coming of judgment day, of accountability to God. They thought, didn't they? They were getting off scot-free. Verse 10, no one sees me. There is no God. No one sees me. I can do whatever I like. I get away with it. Not. I guess that is something that Matt Hancock thought when he did what he did recently. But he was caught, wasn't he, on camera. Well, we're all being caught, aren't we, on God's camera. The Lord sees all. He sees it. He sees everything. And there is a day of judgment. It's coming. It's promised. And nothing can stop it. As we've seen in verses 11 and 15 in particular, or those final verses, that you cannot conjure it away. You can't ward it off. You can't, through fitness and exercise and healthy eating, keep death away. You can't even keep illness away. The healthiest people get struck down, right? How do you, how do you avoid you know, cancer and, and, and things like that? You, you just can't. You can try as hard as you can to keep well, but... And no technologies, and no magic tricks, and no sort of lucky charms can stop this from happening to us. We will have to face the Lord on Judgment Day. Acts 17, verse 31, He has set a day when He will judge the world with justice by the man He has appointed, Jesus Christ. He has given proof of this. We have a God, don't we, who gives proof who proves himself, and proves himself through the Lord Jesus Christ, through his resurrection. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. Nothing can stop it. There will be payback for God's people on that day. God's persecuted people. There are people in this world, perhaps some of you, you're thinking about them now. They're God's people. They belong to him, but they're being persecuted. They're being killed. They're being beaten up. Because they believe in Jesus. God here is promising to act on behalf of his people. In verse 6, I gave them into your hand and you showed them no mercy. And God is going to react to that. He's going to respond to them. He's jealous for his people. He's protective of us. We are the apple of his eye and he will pay back in his own time those who hurt his own. Second Thessalonians, back in Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians 1, 6 to 10. God is just. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you, believer, and give relief to you who are troubled and to us as well. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed in heaven, or from heaven, sorry, in blazing fire with his powerful angels. He will punish those who do not know God and do not Obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. There will be payback for God's people. There will be justice. Justice will be served. Justice will be done on the day of judgment. He will judge the world with justice, with absolute fairness. No one will be able to say, God, that's not fair what you did. But, of course, for now, we must leave it in his hands. We don't take justice into our own hands, do we? Because if we did, we'd mess it up. We do not take revenge, we leave it to him. But these are words, aren't they, especially for persecuted Christians across the world today and across all time. I think there's a very clear message here to avoid magic or the occult or horoscopes or Ouija boards or spiritualism. All of these things are pointed out in the Bible is not only foolish, but dangerous. Don't go there. 
they are still with us. In fact, some people think they're more and more with us. As people look for a, a way to satisfy their spirits, you walk away from God. You don't stop worshipping at all. You start worshipping anything. And some people go to these things. And to some extent, they depend on them. But they are powerless before God, before Almighty God. They can do nothing to ward off or to conjure away His action in your life. They may seem, verse 14, like a, a comforting fire to sit by. But all you will get is burn. There are people, aren't there, who, who will deny that Jesus ever did a miracle, but they will open the newspaper to read a horoscope every day. And maybe, to some extent, it shapes their lives, their thinking, their expectations. And that goes right back to the Babylonians. They were the experts. They were the leaders. They would spent hours and hours and years and years on these things. A great little book that I've been reading on Isaiah uh, puts it this way. How much effort, referring to horoscopes, how much effort goes into saying something each day in the horoscope that gives the illusion of meaning while being so vague in general that it can cover anything that happens. That's what a horoscope is, isn't it? It's something that is, it gives an illusion of meaning. But it's so vague in general that it can cover anything that happens. And then he asked this important question. I think perhaps this gets to the heart of what we're looking at here in Isaiah 47. What is the attraction of a horoscope? Or what is the attraction of, of magic? Or what is the attraction of believing that your ancestors are somehow watching over you and, and helping you, uh, you know, with your life? And that's a very popular view, isn't it? What is that attraction? He says it's the same attraction that it's had for 5,000 years. I can get control of my life by getting a glimpse of what is fated to occur today. I can get control of my life. That's what we're after, isn't it? That's what we're kind of looking for. We want to, we want to be in control. We don't like the idea that we're not in control. None of their technologies, none of their techniques, none of their tricks could remotely save them from God. And it's true for us too. I'll come back to that idea of control in a moment. Only the Lord can save us from his punishment. Only the Lord can save us from himself. The message of the Bible is, run from the Lord to the Lord. Run from his wrath, his anger, to his mercy. It's the only safe place. It's the only sure place. So let me come back to that idea of control again. The Babylonians would discover, as everyone discovers sooner or later, that we cannot completely control our lives. Of course, we have to make plans, and often the plans do come to pass. But we cannot completely control, ultimately control, our futures. Certainly not by horoscopes, or magic, or amulets, or trinkets, or necklaces, or even a little cross around our necks. Or by praying to saints. Or by praying to the Virgin Mary. All of these things, says the Bible, is powerless. Do you depend on these things at all? I don't know if anybody has a, a lucky rabbit's foot. Or do you depend to some extent on horoscopes? Perhaps you laugh it off a little bit. But actually it makes a bit of an impact upon you. Or a stone that you keep in... I don't know, your pocket or your handbag or even, like I said, a cross that somehow is your little lucky charm to protect you from danger. Or some saint's, um, I don't know, representation. Or there's the thought, isn't there, very popular, that you can still be guided by family, dead family members. You know, those who have passed away. We hear it on the news all the time, don't we? That, I think I heard it in the news this week. Someone passes away and they say, I'm sure they're watching over us. Uh, and and they're, they're guiding us. 
and they're applauding us and they're proud of us. I can, you can understand the feeling. That it's a natural kind of feeling. But the Bible teaches that those who die play no part in this life now. Play no part in this life. They are not hovering over us. They are not watching over us. That's ancestor worship. And it has no part in the Bible. And it has no power over what the Lord can do. I remember going to uh, three young boys after their grand grandmother, Nan, had died. And they wanted to know, can she still hear us? Can she still see us? Is she still here? That was the one thing that was on their minds. It, it's very popular, isn't it? The Bible teaches that when you die, your spirit returns to God. But you play no part in the activities of this world now. They are in the Lord's hands. You see, you can be free from all these superstitions. Black cats, rabbit's feet, walking under ladders. Those things that might have just a little bit of a controlling effect on your life. Be free. They don't control life. The Lord does. To the most intimate degree. Well, I'm going on a bit long, so I'm going <laughs> to have to bring it to a close soon. But we cannot control our lives, can we? I just, uh, just to give you this little illustration, I was watching a program the other day about England football managers since 1966, and one of them, uh, you might remember the late 80s, was Glenn Hoddle, who'd been a Spurs player. The program was called The Impossible Job, being an England football manager. And we were told that Glenn Hoddle had a Christian faith. We were shown pictures of him singing a, a song, a bit like the one we, we sang at the beginning there. I um, don't think it was exactly that one. But uh, he, had a, he had a kind of a, a faith, a Christian faith. But then, and this is what brought him down from the job, actually, we were, were reminded that he believed in reincarnation. Well, that's not at all Christian. We don't believe in reincarnation. The Bible says it is appointed us, to us once to die and then to face judgment. Once to die. We don't die many times. We don't live many times. We live once and then we go to the Lord. We cannot control our lives, especially not our future or destiny. We cannot escape death and we cannot escape judgment day by our little tricks. And I think what this all comes down to is the idea that religion can be just a little bit of an insurance policy. That it can be my way of trying to control God. It can be my way of trying to manipulate God. I'm trying to keep God happy, you see. So that if I go to church just enough times, and if I say my prayers before bed, and perhaps if I do some religious things, and I'm nice to my neighbors, and I'm kind to animals, then that will keep God happy. I won't have to worry too much about him, and I'll keep him happy. But what kind of relationship is that? Imagine that if I um, were to, to give my wife flowers every week, and the rest of the time I completely ignored. I wonder if your Christian life's a bit like that. You come to church maybe regularly, faithfully, religiously. But the rest of the week, you hardly think about him. And you don't truly love him. The Lord has made us for a relationship with him. Not to be manipulated by him or controlled by him. Not merely to be religious. Don't ever forget, finally, how much you need the Lord. The Babylonians had fallen into a terrible complacency. They felt like they were untouchable. They felt that they did not need him or anything, really, other than their own power. But we live and move and breathe in him, don't we? Every moment, utterly dependent on him. How quickly we forget him and how much we need him. I was struggling a bit with this message yesterday to put it together. Suddenly I thought to myself, I've hardly even prayed for God's help with this. I've been working away at it for some hours and through the week, I guess, and I'd hardly pray for God's help. How easily and how often we can struggle along with things before we realize I haven't even asked for God's help with this. And we forget him. Let's never forget who he is and how much we need him. He is our Redeemer. 
The Lord Almighty is his name, the Holy One of Israel. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, you are a great and glorious God. We acknowledge you. We confess our sin to you, our rebellion, our forgetfulness of you day by day. Even as we face difficulties and challenges, we often forget just to turn to you for your help and guidance. Pray, Lord, that you would give us wisdom and grace to do that continually, to pray continually, to rely upon you, to trust in you with all our hearts, because you are the one who is truly trustworthy. Help us in Jesus' name. Amen.